So tonight I'm going to share with us from the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, beginning at the fifth chapter and the second verse. Uh, I, I will remind you simply that the, the words are always in the bulletin if you'd like to read along, and I just invite you to do so or to hear the word of the Lord read this evening. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the warriors, had died during the journey through the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt. Although all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people born on the journey through the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the Israelites traveled for 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the warriors who came out of Egypt, perished, not having listened to the voice of the Lord. To them the Lord swore that he would not let them see the land that he had sworn to their ancestors to give us, a a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of all the nation was done, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. The Lord said to Joshua, today, I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Would you pray with me? Loving God, as we hear these words, as we consider the moment when so much change for the Israelites after 40 years of wandering, after the promise of the promised land is realized, help us to be in touch with the same promises you have placed on our lives, with the same steadfast keeping of the covenant that we know of you. And so, God, I pray in these moments that you would speak through me, and if need be, in spite of me, so that your word alone would be heard. Amen. All right, so I keep saying the word Lent because it's Lent. Um, and as most of you know, and I think as I've, as I've said, Lent is basically based off of the 40 days of wilderness that Jesus spent between his baptism and the start of his ministry as the Gospels lay it out. Forty days and forty days, that's what Lent is. It's, interesting. it's forty days unless you count Sundays, then it becomes this other number that I don't know because I forgot to look it up before I got up here. But the point is, is that forty days of Jesus' wilderness is where we get the forty days from. But also, there is this connection to the forty years of the Israelites wandering in the desert because it is also a wilderness time. A time of dissent and idolatry and and of rebellion, um, but also of God's intense provision in the midst of all of that stuff. As they escaped oppression and enslavement, they began to wander. As, As this passage of Joshua briefly names, there was all sorts of ways that they sort of put that to the test as they went, but that's not what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, What I want to talk about here is what happens after they sort of bookend that time. And I say bookend because it's it's interesting that, as you probably recall, one of the most famous moments, one of the best known moments of that time of wilderness and wandering is Moses at the Red Sea, when he parts the waters so that they can escape the Egyptians who have decided, after all, no, we don't want to let you go and come after them. And here, right before this passage, 
The same happens in the River Jordan. The waters are parted, and the Israelites walk across on dry ground, and they find themselves in this land that God has promised them. And so in part, what's beautiful about this passage to me is that it proves that these, this promise of God is, is real and effective. It is, it is not just, hey, you know what, um, go that way and you'll find a land of milk and honey, a, the promised land. But in fact, here they have found it. The other thing that um, really speaks to that, though, is during that 40 years, God provided them manna. Now, some of you remember manna from Sunday school, or I don't know where you remember it from, but you probably know what I'm talking about, is that when they realized that they didn't have enough to eat, God said, okay, I got you. I will take care of this. And every day, for decades, manna would appear for them to eat. As much as they needed for them and their family every day for years and years. And to me, one of the most striking moments of this passage from Joshua is this very simple statement. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. And instead, I'm adding that word, but instead they ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Now, on the one hand, what that speaks to is the realization of that promise of God. The promised land, the land of milk and honey. And here they are in a place where they can rely on the land to provide rather than this miraculous manna every day, which let's be honest, after 40 years, they were probably getting a little tired of it anyways, but I'm, I don't want to read into that too much. But now they have entered into this land of resources and opportunities, and it is absolutely wonderful that, that God's promises continue in this new way, including, again, this land that is so often referred to as a land of milk and honey. Opportunities, resources, it's all there. But the other side of that is for decades they have relied on God for the simple sustenance to get through the day, the week, the month, the years, provided to them by God directly in the manna. And now they can provide for themselves, which again, that's great, but there's also this warning in this passage and the ongoing teachings of Joshua that, that says, listen, okay, yeah, now you can do this. You have just taken the Passover with the resources of the land that God has promised you and that you now find yourselves in, but be careful you do not set God aside. You are no longer wandering. You're no longer lost, but do not set God aside. You can now care for yourselves and others in new ways. You can find reliance in your labor, in your stability, but do not set God aside. In this passage alone, this is marked in a lot of ways. One of them, uh, this sort of reliance on God that is named in the circumcision of the males who were born since they left Egypt. I also want to say, aren't we glad today for backspace and erasers and whiteout? Because here's what I think. I'm just going to throw this out there. I, this is random. I don't know if this should taste of squirrel, but I just have to. Whoever wrote this wrote, make flint and eyes and circumcise the Israelites a second time. But you know what? They couldn't erase that. And then he spends the entire paragraph to clarify he's not actually circumcising anyone a second time. I'm just making sure. Be clear. I'm talking about the males who've been born since the others who were circumcised. But it's still, it's this beautiful thing to say, listen, not only has God provided for us for so long that the men who left, who left Egypt, who left the, the oppression and the enslavement of Egypt have died. It's been that long. And yet these new children, these new families who have grown up in this wilderness time find themselves committing themselves to God in this very moment, right as they enter in the promised land, professing their faith, their gratitude, and their reliance on God. In addition, there's that really beautiful promise that we, in fact, even though I muddled it a little bit, that we, we named in our confession as God says, today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And part of what that makes me feel like this pointing back to is that God is pointing all the way back to their time in Egypt, which does not ignore the 40 years in between, which again was marked not just with faithfulness, but with idolatry and dissent and arguing and fighting. And yet God says, I have rolled away from you that disgrace. 
And so here they, they profess God. They name the, the gifts of God's provision and that God has always kept that covenant. And so it will remain as they enter into this land of milk and honey. Unless, or should I say until, they forget God. In, in little ways, in, in, in big ways, and, and really in everything in between. And, and what strikes me is that this is not just some story of persons we know to be a part of the history of our own faith, but this is our story as well. We who live in a land of milk and honey, a land that is filled with opportunities for us to achieve so much, to provide so much and well into excess to the point where it can be difficult to remember God or, or to rely on God or to not set God aside. Part of what I think about with this is the idea of bread or the idea just of food. Has anybody ever, and I won't make you raise your hand because I don't want you to feel like you have to because the person next to you is, but, but think about it. Do you, do you say grace before you have a meal? I, I generally do. I gen, I'm, I'll admit sometimes I forget and I get halfway through and I'm like, oh, man, I'm glad I'll never tell anybody about this. But then, so like we, oh, never mind. The point is, is that we do that. We give thanks to God. But, but think about the difference between manna on the ground that every day I come out and it's just there and versus I went to... Uh, I went to the grocery store, and I picked this off the, off the shelf, and I paid for it with money that I earned. And so we say God provided that. Or maybe you're sitting at home, and if you're like me, Instacart, my new favorite thing. Um, I said I'd just do it through COVID. <laughs> anyways, I paid for a year. I'm going to, anyways, okay, look, the point is, is that it's so convenient. No, that's not the point. The point is, is that it's really easy to realize, look, I, I work hard for, for, for the money I make, and I spend that money on food, and so did God provide that food for me? Now, I believe yes, and I know a lot of you believe yes, but, it, but it's so easy to set God aside in that moment, to say, I did this, I built this, I, I earned this, and to not take a moment and to give thanks to God. Or simply to acknowledge, and again, I, I joke about, you know, did you say grace or not, um, mostly to, you know, try and normalize the fact that I really do forget sometimes, and I don't know why I went back to that. But look, the point is, is, that, is that it's so easy to set God aside to, in, in a land of milk and honey, to know that all that we can achieve and do, it's easy for us to forget that God is a part of it, and to forget that steadfast, incredible, sustaining love and presence of God. We are surrounded by so many opportunities and gifts and possibilities, and we have the option of choosing those instead of God and choosing and living into them in ways that would move us away from God. We can be lured, if you will, to celebrate ourselves rather than to celebrate God, to forget that God is ever keeping the covenant with us to forget that God continues to provide for us, that God is still at work in the land of milk and honey. And to forget that living in such a land as we do does require us to pay attention a little differently and to remember a little differently. To seek instead treasures in heaven. To reach always for the bread of life. And to seek to drink living water. One of the ways that I just want to invite all of us to do this is to think of Lent as a, as a time that we covenant afresh with God, to remember the ways that God has provided for us, to open ourselves up for the ways God wants to provide for us and is providing for us here and now, to find ways to, to acknowledge, to recognize the idols of our time, those things that, that would take the place of God, take the place of God who, who so wants to sustain and power and teach and, and guide and provide for us that instead we say, well, that does that too, and that's a little easier. <laughs> but those things in which we put our trust, to name them and to say, is this helping us set aside God? And if it is, to think about well, how, how is that idol creeping in and, and where, how are we called to covenant afresh with God?
And I, my friends, I believe that if we do so, then we can enjoy not just the land of milk and honey that we find ourselves in, which we should, but enjoy the steadfast love of God in who we are and in all that we do. Thanks be to God. Amen.